So I'm going to take you through uh, both the bottling process and putting on a new brew without with a zero waste um, brewing methodology. We've been brewing our own cider, beer, wine, whatever you want to call it, um, for, I mean, of course there are differences, pretty much for a decade. And moving away from the commercial alcohol industry has been a big thing for us. Most of it's just using industrial fruit and grains and things like that. So we want to move away from that for our health. We want to move away from it because uh, we want to move away from money. Um, so brewing your own uh, booze is not just, um, you know, we're not great alcohol drinkers in our house. We like to get up early. We like to be fresh and into the day. But to have um, local ciders for the, the post-pandemic um, celebrations. So we want to have lots of really good stuff to, to celebrate with. So what I'm going to do is put on a pear cider. We pasteurize um, uh, our fruit into these recycled, re, uh, recycled caps and jars. Um, and we do it through our steam juicer. If you want to know more about a steam juicer, there's lots of stuff online. So I'm not going to go into that now. But that steam juicer pretty much produces this shelf-stable uh, juice. And this is our, uh, actually, this is a combination of our pears and our friend Nick Massaro's beautiful brown pears. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a very basic um, ferment using this uh, pasteurized pear juice. So we're mixing two different pears. Basically, I'm going to pour all the pear juice into here. So there are no wild yeasts remaining in this pear juice because it's gone through the steam juice process. That's why the lids are clicking. There's no microecology in here as yet. There's just about to be. Thanks. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, yeah, it usually takes about um, four and a half of these little guys. Oh, I've got some beneficial yeasts here in juniper berry, in dandelion flowers, and our wonderful elder flower. Our elder flower in our garden flowers almost all year round, so it's fantastic for natural brewers or home brewers. Uh, juniper berries, which we grow in the garden, juniper berries have fantastic uh, natural yeasts on them. So these are dried, and we put these away uh, for cooking. We use it like a spice. And common old dandelion. How can you not love the dandelion? It, it just keeps giving and giving and giving. It is such an adaptable and wonderful, generous, generous weed. Um, feral, like us. I'm going to use elder flower. Now, I'm putting in quite a lot for such a small brew, but that's because it's not the morning where the nectar is at its highest concentrate. Um, and the, uh, it's, they're quite, the flowers are quite old. While I'm here, I'm just going to throw in some dandies and a few juniper berries as well. Chuck it all in. Chuck it all in. Right, I'm going to push it down. And I'm going to put a lid on it. And top it up with water so nothing else can get in. So only the carbon dioxide can uh, be released so and that will get released once it starts fermenting you'll start to see uh, air bubbles being uh, given off I might give it a bit of a swirl just to make sure all the flowers are covered in a couple of days it probably only needs 24 hours but I might leave it for two days I need to strain all that out so I put it into a fresh jar with the um, cheesecloth so we've just got the juice then I label it uh, the date um, what it is and leave it on the fermenting table. This grape cider from our grapes, uh, a couple of different varieties of grapes. This, um, because I pressed the grapes in this beautiful contraption, um, so you probably hunt around for a second hand one, put the grapes in there, put the lid on top, uh, which is just a flat board and basically there's a little funnel there we usually put something at the back so this is tipping and then into a bucket so we'll, we'll do it over a ledge and straight into a bucket when you press like fruit like this it'll have its wild yeasts and 
So basically you just um, leave them to ferment. That's what we did with this here. It's been fermenting for about two weeks now and it's still active and I'm not going to bottle it with any priming um, agent like say dextrose malt which will lightly carbonate. It is actually still active so I'm wanting this right at the bell curve. So it's gone up, it's active, 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 it's come right down but it hasn't fully finished. And if you can um, bottle the bottom of the bell curve before it's completely fermented out, then you'll get a natural carbonation. And that's what I'm hoping for here. Although the wonderful thing about wild fermentation is that you, uh, it is uncertainty of not knowing. Uh, something I learned from lovely David Arnold from our Mernyong farm in Violet Town. He taught me years ago because one of the things I was stressing to him, I've got this whole natural brew, this zero waste, brewing procedure, but I'm buying this sterilizing product, some chemical to sterilize my bottles. And I, I don't want that in my body. I don't want it in my system, in our gray water system. He said, I, I never use sterilizing products or powders. And I said, well, really? Don't you have a whole lot of brews that go to waste? He said, never. So basically these bottles, when I finish a drink, a little bit of water, rinse it out, turn it upside down, leave it above the sink or put it on the bottle rack. That will get rid of any crud, any remnant sugars. I'm so convinced of this method, just this sort of little bit of water, shake, tip it out, put it on a bottle rack or, or leave it to drip dry. I, I don't even um, uh, do any washing before uh, bottling. However, if I really have got such a great brew, it's been an incredible experiment and I want to be really sure, I'll use a bit of hot water and soap. And I'll put all the bottles through and I'll, I'll do that whole process again. Uh, let them drip dry um, and then I'll bottle. So these are all ready to bottle. So I'm going to brew this, uh, what I call a grape cider, not a grape wine, um, mainly because I've made it pretty much in a conventional cider way. Now, at this point, you've got to kind of work pretty fast. You don't want the vinegar molecules, which follow the yeast, um, the yeasts. You don't want them to um, be the dominant. Uh... You want a funnel? Yeah, I'll get a funnel, thanks, man. Oh yeah, so the top, I use it today. Great, funnel's just washed, that's what we want. And I'm just simply going to pour it in. I want to leave a little bit of air, but not too much as well. All I'm going to do is reuse these twist tops. Some of them get damaged and um, if you use a tea towel and screw them up, the natural carbonation will build up pressure and seal the whole thing. So there's one, it's as simple as that. Now, if say uh, I have a bottle like this, I wanna do a long neck, and it's not, um, I'll take the old label off, and it's not uh, a, a twist top, then I can still use my twist tops and I'll show you how to do that. So I'll fill up this long neck. There's the brew. I've got one of these which are really low tech, very cheap. You can, um, you can buy of course new caps and they're more splayed out and you put them on top, put that on top and bang with a hammer, not too, too rigorously because you'll smash the whole thing but you'll get the hang of it. But in this case, I'm just gonna get the twist top lid to put it on top like that, if it will sit. Get it as flat as I can. There we go, that's pretty flat. And then one of these is pretty handy to have as a home brewer. Again, this is not very expensive, this equipment, and you can just get away with one of these. Now I'm gonna push it down really tightly and if I can't twist this then it's sealed and I can't twist it so it's beautifully done now the thing about using 
non-twist top bottles is that once that cap's gone, it's gone. But a good gift size. Um, in terms, like Meg and I are very big on the gift economy. And if you've got a, if we've got a really good brew that we think is excellent, um, we'll think, right, let's get some friends some of our pear cider or our um, prickly pear cider or something like that. So what I'm gonna do is ask Meg to um, pause uh, the uh, video. I'm gonna bottle all that up. Great, we're back. So here's the little brew uh, of four liters in various bottles. I've got a really good feeling about this. Uh, and the reason why, and what I neglected to tell you, is you need to taste your brews before you bottle them. If there's an infection, uh, it'll taste terrible. Even though a green brew, which means um, it hasn't bottled aged, uh, will taste a bit unusual. It's not going to taste like a finished, finished drink by any means. But if you can taste it and you can taste the life in it, the flavor in it, the, uh, in this case, the sweetness in it, and it's all going well, bottle it. So this is, uh, thankfully, at the end, I, let, I saved a bit and I thought, oh my God, I haven't even tasted it, but it's fantastic. Mm. These have been labeled, so they'll go down to the cellar. When this whole COVID-19 epidemic's over, we're gonna have a nice little gathering. We're gonna spark up the uh, sauna, get some good um, trestle tables in the garden, get some nice fires burning outside, and we'll all have a sweat, and we'll all have a cider, and we'll all have some gorgeous food, and we'll all have lots of bloody big hugs. Mm.